Hi guys, I'm back uh, with another RK PCB repair, step-by-step -step repair. Uh, and today we're going to look into this PCB here, <clears throat> another two-board set of the game called Pleiades, which was released in 1981 by a company called M-Star, which also made the uh, classic arcade game Phoenix. And this video is actually the third video in a series of probably four videos. In the first two videos, we um, already fixed um, those boards here, which are the classic Phoenix PCBs. So if you uh, missed out on those videos, you are free to uh, watch them, of course. But anyhow, in this video, we are going to look at uh, this uh, board right here. Well, and this is how the game would actually look in MAME. Uh, it says as a, a small note here that the colors aren't correct, uh, correctly emulated uh, on MAME. But this is what we're actually looking for. It's uh, looking, uh, on the first glance, looking rather similar to um, the Phoenix game. Uh, okay, but uh, let's not waste time. Let's get, um, let's get right into the repair. We do actually have um, two sets of Pleiades uh, PCBs, as you know. And um, as a starting strategy, uh, I already uh, tried several combinations um, of boards and uh, checked uh, what they would actually do. These are all supposed to be not working. And um, actually, um, I tried all four combinations. So we have CPU board one and we have a CPU board 2 and we have logic board number 1 and logic board number 2. So I tried uh, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1 and 2, 2 and they all did pretty much the same. They all had um, garbage on the screen. So no combination of boards actually produced some um, outstanding results so to say. So um, it doesn't really matter where we start. So I just uh, suggest uh, that we uh, start uh, with this combination here. Um, also, um, the boards aren't really uh, complete regarding uh, the uh, ICs. And I already <coughs> moved uh, all the ICs that we have over to our first uh, test subject here um, on the table. So the, uh, <coughs> the on the logic board, we have two missing um, EPROMs, which is not uh, too much of a problem. We can reburn those. This, this is okay. Um, the test board is completely populated, uh, but uh, on this board we have several ICs missing. Uh, these are uh, the pallet PROMs, uh, which are missing. Um, the CPU is missing. This is some... Um, uh, logic chip, uh, 74 logic chip that is missing and also the sound chip is missing. So uh, we would have to get some replacement ICs uh, for this PCB before we can even get uh, this to work. But um, we have uh, our first combination here. We have completely populated. Actually, not really completely because as um, the Pleiades game, the, uh, uh, excuse me, as the Phoenix um, game, the Pleiades game has two pallet prompts. And um, one of these pallet prompts is from Pleiades, which is this here. And this here I borrowed uh, from Phoenix um, because it was missing also. Um, so we might actually get some wrong colors because of that, because this might not be uh, the correct palette on this problem. But, uh, this uh, shouldn't be too much of a problem. If we get the game running, maybe the colors are a bit off, but uh, we should actually be able, with all the uh, sockets populated, to really get uh, this PCB going. Okay, and if we fire this combination up, uh, this is what we are getting at the moment. So just um, uh, garbage on the screen. So, as always, 
We are going to start off with our logic probe. I already printed out a fresh uh, set of schematics uh, for the PCB, uh, which actually for the Pleiades PCBs look pretty similar to the uh, Phoenix PCBs, even though the, the layout of the PCB is a bit different. Uh, the, um, uh, the schematics actually look pretty much the same. Um, it's really great that you can get all this stuff on cloth, really. Okay, so we are going to uh, hook up our logic probe and uh, uh, we will start to uh, do some checks regarding the CPU, see if the CPU is running at all, if the address data bus is doing anything and so on and so on. Just uh, the usual stuff, so let's go. Okay, so I hooked up um, uh, the logic probe and um, I'm looking at the uh, CPU um, and what I see is that we actually do have um, activity on um, the address lines and on the uh, data lines. So the CPU is actually running um, and of course we have clock signal, we have power, we have all the uh, signals we would actually expect in uh, normal operation. So um, the CPU wants to run, but it is obviously not uh, really executing uh, the program uh, properly. Uh, what we uh, again see uh, as a result is this garbage on the screen. So um, the CPU doesn't even fill um, the screen RAM uh, with anything uh, successfully. So, um, as always, we now would look ha would have to look into the EPROMs, see if they have uh, activity on their um, data and address lines and if they are being enabled. So, if the uh, CPU is actually trying to talk to the uh, EPROMs. Okay, so what we can see here is that the CPU is actually um, talking to the EPROM chips Chip select pin uh, would be pin, to pin 20. Okay, so there's no activity right here. There was actually activity a moment ago. Let me just reset the game. So, yeah, okay, we are back. So we got the CPU talking to this guy and address lines, data lines are <clears throat> are active. Um, so the CPU is trying to talk to the program ROMs, but somehow can't run. Um, what the next uh, logical step uh, at this point would actually be to um, get these uh, program ROMs out of their sockets, uh, read them uh, with an EEPROM reader on the PC and compare them with the uh, MAMES ROM collection so uh, that we uh, are sure that uh, those EEPROMs are actually holding uh, the correct uh, content for the game to run. Okay, so I just um, read uh, all of the uh, EEPROM chips on the board uh, with my EEPROM reader and um, compared them uh, with uh, the MAME ROMs collection, which you can do with this nice um, ROM ident uh, command parameter. And uh, as it turns out, all the ICs that are read are actually uh, correct. So uh, they are all um, having uh, the uh, correct content. So it does not appear to be a, a problem of the data that is on the EEPROMs. The data is correct. Okay, so let's summarize. Um, the game shows garbage on the screen. Uh, we know that the um, CPU is working. I actually took it from a, um, from a Phoenix uh, PCB. It is the same uh, CPU, by the way, as in the game Phoenix. The CPU seems to have all the signals that it basically needs to run. All the um, address and data lines show activity. 
Um, and also on the uh, EEPROM chips, uh, we have chip enables and we have activity on all the uh, data and address lines. But nevertheless, uh, the game isn't working. So it, what it probably comes down to again, uh, as uh, with, a, with the previous uh, Phoenix repair, we seem to have some sort of bus, so e e either address or data bus, or decoding problem. So even though the ICs are working, um, sort of, they do not seem to be able to communicate really. And uh, this results in the CPU uh, not really running the program that is on the EEPROMs. And um, a, a very nice way, a different way, uh, to uh, in comparison to what we did in the last video, to actually troubleshoot this uh, kind of issue is uh, using uh, another really nice device, which I uh, actually got uh, out of the uh, attic uh, today, so uh, it can be used again. And uh, the device that I'm talking about is this uh, Fluke uh, 9010 micro uh, system troubleshooter. Okay, and how the Fluke works is uh, that it is actually being uh, connected uh, to the PCB uh, via the uh, CPU socket and the uh, whole machine uh, together with this port over here um, is actually acting as a replacement uh, CPU for the game. And uh, the advantage of this is that uh, this, as a replacement for the CPU, can not only run uh, the game or the program, but you can also, as you have, you know, um, keyboard access to talk to the CPU, you can actually um, let the machine automatically check uh, the bus lines and you can also check uh, the EEPROMs. You can try to read from the EEPROMs. You can try to read from a certain location. You, the device will then show uh, the data on the, uh, on the display here. Or you can uh, uh, um, actually calculate checksums for regions of EEPROMs and then compare uh, if they can be uh, read correctly. You can also do some uh, RAM tests and I.O. tests and all uh, th uh, sorts of uh, crazy uh, things with, uh, with this really uh, neat device. So, okay, so uh, let's, uh, we are back to the garbage, so uh, let's uh, start our tests. Okay, so the first thing uh, we uh, could do is actually run a bus test just by pressing this button here. And the machine uh, immediately says, that's already very good. It says bus test, okay. So uh, what does this uh, tell us? Uh, well, I think what the machine does to test the, the uh, data and the address bus is uh, to actually try to toggle uh, the data lines and address lines uh, to what it wants. And uh, it checks whether the, um, the bus lines actually accept uh, the signal changes or um, uh, if they are stuck high or stuck low, uh, or any, anything uh, this machine would uh, report it, or if they are shorted at some uh, point, uh, the machine could tell us, but uh, this doesn't seem to be the case. <clears throat> so the next uh, thing we could do is we could actually try to read um, from uh, the EEPROMs, and we could start with the first chip uh, over here, which is IC47. Um, and this is um, this would also be, um, as this is hooked up, um, uh, this would also be uh, the uh, first EEPROM that the uh, CPU is um, talking to um, when uh, the game is starting up. So we can actually do a, a ROM check here. Okay, so um, every item uh, of uh, the game, so the um, the EEPROMs, uh, the RAM chips, and also the I/O stuff, um, actually do have a certain address. Uh, this is what we already talked about uh, in the last video, I think. 
um, you can actually look into the main source code to really find out uh, what address uh, uh, those EEPROMs are having because now we uh, actually need to know if we want to talk to them using the fluke and you can maybe find also on the web uh, those uh, memory maps as they are called and uh, we can see that uh, the address range 0 to 3 FFF is actually 16 kilobytes of ROM which uh, is uh, the program ROM this is the uh, memory map for Phoenix but it's the same for uh, clear these I think so uh, we could actually try to talk to the first of the ROM chips uh, by uh, looking at um, an address range of 0 to 07 FF uh, so 800 hex is uh, equal to um, 2 kilobytes of data which is what fits on those EEPROM chips so the first chip would be you can actually type that in right here so we do ROM check and we test <coughs> um, the area from 0000, 0, 0, 0 to 0, 7 FF so this would be the content of the first uh, of the first chip. Let's do this. So, um, what you get back uh, after this uh, test is finished, you get a signature. So, the Fluke actually could talk to the ROM and it calculated a signature um, of the uh, data that it read from the EEPROM, sort of like a, a checksum. And this checksum calculated by the fluke is um, FC8D. And um, how do we know if this signature is actually correct for the uh, data on the EEPROM uh, that we are expecting? Um, we can check this by, again, um, looking into the uh, into the MAMES um, uh, data files or actually we can use the, um, the data that I just read from the IC uh, when I checked it in the uh, EEPROM reader and we can calculate the, the signature from this data that I read uh, with my EEPROM reader and compare it with this uh, signature and if they are identical that means that the fluke can actually read uh, the data that is on the EEPROM correctly. Okay, so there are several ways to actually um, calculate uh, the signature from the data. There's tools uh, from uh, there's tools out from several uh, websites. This is actually from uh, Quarter Arcade, um, and uh, it has calculated the signatures for the files that I read from the IC. So IC47 should have a signature of 14DE, uh, which it actually doesn't. So the data uh, we are getting from the EEPROM does not seem to be correct, actually. Okay, so the signature appears to be incorrect, but at least um, the fluke actually read something, so uh, what we could do is um, actually try uh, to check individual uh, bytes of data and uh, verify if they are being uh, read out correctly. So I just in a hex editor on my PC, I opened the uh, the data file for the EEPROM uh, chip in question and I made a photo of it so we can look at the data right here. So uh, it starts up here so it's 8 times 0, 0 and then at position 8 we have a 31, at 9 we have an FF, then we have 4B, then 26 and so on and so on. So we can actually enter those addresses here. For instance we can read at address 0 and we get a 0 back. 
which would be correct. Um, so we can just make another pick. So just position one should also be a zero. So read one is also zero. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's skip ahead. Let, let's read at position eight. This is when it gets more interesting. Position eight is a, hey, 31. That is correct. So position nine should be FF. Position nine is FF. That's great. Okay, so, and let's just for fun, let's take some something down here. Maybe we want to have the CD that would be F8, I think, F and the 8, okay, so we do a read at uh, F8 and we get the CD, yeah, that's great. So actually the, the EPROM can be read. So why was the um, signature wrong? Really, I don't know. Maybe we just repeat the signature check. Mm. So let's just try this. So we have zero 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 to zero seven FF, and um, we do expect a signature of fourteen DE. Um, as per the data that we want to see there. And, uh, okay. Let's check again. This always takes a second. Okay, it says arrow. Signature was 27E6, not 14DE. Okay, 27E6, I think. Uh, this is not what we got when we tried this the first time, was it? Um, so maybe we'll do this again. So this is 26E6. Okay, so running the test again. Okay, now we get A3F2. Okay, so we are getting a different signature each time we read this, even though uh, we appear to get the correct data if we read an individual cell. Let's just try it again. Let's do address 85, which would be CA. Read 85, which is CA. So we can read individual positions, as it seems, but when it comes to reading the whole EEPROM, um, the checksum seems to be messed up anyhow. Very interesting. Okay, so I made an additional screenshot of the um, end of the data file, just to verify. So uh, 7FF would be FF. So we could check uh, right at the end. 07FF would be FF, that is correct. Or maybe we can check 0C. Um, uh, excuse me, 7CF, which would be C9. 7CF, which is FD. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. 07CF. 
That is incorrect. Cool. Very interesting. Zero seven. This should be C9. Why is it FD? Yes, very, very, very interesting. We're, I, yeah, I don't know. We have to find a pattern here, I think. So let's look at the uh, upper left corner. This would be uh, 6B0, 6B0. We would expect a 60. Yes, we get a 60, okay. After that, we have a 70, 6B1. 70 is okay, 6B2 is 71, that is already incorrect, 6B2 is 71, why 71, so in the third line is incorrect, okay, we do, we look at the fourth one here, so 6B4, 6B4 is C0. That is correct again. Mm, 6B5 is C8 is also correct. 6B6 is C1. So right, 6B7 is C9, 6B8 is A2, correct, 6B9, oh, excuse me, 6B9 is 0, 6B8 is B3, also incorrect. It uh, should be A3. Hmm. Let's read again. 6, 6 B, A is B3. 6, um, 6 B, B is 0, which is correct. Um, Uh, 6 B C is 21, right? 6 B D, 6 B D, F9 is incorrect, should be B8, and we have 6 B E. E is 30, uh, 43 is right and we have 6BF which is FF which is also not correct it's very interesting so we in this line we had three particular positions which were incorrect okay so I think I found something here I have made a small list of um, of uh, EEPROM pos data positions where I am getting incorrect values. Uh, in the first um, column here, you see the values that I would expect to receive. And these are the values that we actually do see on the fluke when we are looking at those posi positions. And uh, this can always be reproduced. So if I look at this position again, it will always uh, show me 7F uh, for some reason. Um, and uh, the question here is, what is the what could what can be the cause of this? This can be, this could be an addressing problem, or this could be a data problem. Meaning, if we want to look at this particular position, maybe the address uh, is uh, that is uh, being transported to the EEPROM is incorrect, and therefore it outputs the data from a different data location that was actually requested. That's one possibility. Or the other possibility is that it is actually looking at the correct position, uh, but that the data is incorrect, either because it is coming from the EEPROM incorrectly out of the storage, so to say, or it is 
uh, somehow lost on the way, way back to the CPU. And uh, what, what you can see uh, in, in this page is that the values that are incorrect are always higher numbers than the values that we would uh, expect. So this uh, here, this side is always larger than, than this side. So um, what we can actually deduce from that is that uh, if we look at these uh, pairs, we can see that sometimes some bits are pulled high, you know, taking this as a base. Uh, if you pull some random bits high, you will be able to get to these values. So it is most likely a data problem. If it was an addressing problem, it would be very likely that sometimes the value would be higher, sometimes the value would be lower, because it's kind of random. Uh, but here, you can see that the output data is somehow modified to be higher, so sometimes some bits of the uh, end result are being pulled high. So, on the first uh, glance, I would say this is this should be the problem of a, a damaged or a non-working EEPROM chip, actually. But we tested it in our reader, and we got uh, the uh, actually we got uh, this data out of the EEPROM reader from the very same chip, and we uh, compared it with the main source, and everything is fine. So in the EEPROM reader, the EEPROM outputs these values correctly. So it is likely very, very likely that um, we have some sort, again, some sort of data bus uh, problem on the board um, where sometimes intermittently maybe there's some disturbances on the bus uh, or there's some signal problems which leads uh, the data that is being transferred to the CPU to have some bits pulled high which shouldn't have been pulled high actually. Okay, so this is getting really, really challenging here. Um, what I did now is I uh, read this address, uh, 7AF with a fluke, and it returns an FF. And um, the fluke signals here that it is looping. I press the loop button, which let, uh, lets the fluke continuously read the address and update this display. So it is reading now at this address all the time. So 7AF and uh, if we look at the cheat sheet, um, 7AF was a spot where we would expect 5E but we do get an FF. Um, so we would actually expect if we look at this uh, uh, binary code, the E would be um, a 1110 one, one, and the F here is a 1111. One, one, one. So at the lowest position, we would like to get a zero, but we are getting a one. And at this position next to it, we are we would like to get a 1 and we are getting a 1. So this is a correct position which is D1 and this is incorrect position D2. Data bus line 0, least significant line and this is D1 and this is D0. So again on D1 we would like to see a 0, we are getting a 1. On uh, on D0. On D1 we would like to see a 1 and we're getting a 1. So and now those two lines while it is reading all the time are hooked up uh, to my oscilloscope. Up here you see D0 I hook them directly up to the EEPROMs and down here you see D1. Um, and uh, we can, you see uh, the intermittent signals from reading the EEPROMs. I will stop now the uh, oscilloscope. And now I can uh, scroll into any position that I like. So we get the signals here. 
and what is really really interesting now is now look at this so this is uh, the above line is data line zero which is um, should output a zero but is outputting a one and this line is a data line that is outputting a one and should also be outputting a one but those uh, signals look different don't they um, the above signal looks like it would like to become a one but then decides well maybe i'll not be a one i'll be a zero or be a point two or something so this is not an e this is a, a this is a, a broad signal which is um, uh, which is pretty much straightforward but this signal up here looks interesting maybe we will uh, scroll to another position if we want look at another one yeah it looks pretty much the same so this is a signal as we would like to see it sort of a block f uh, form but this says okay i'm one no i'm not one so something funky going on i don't know what's happening here maybe two guys are talking at the same time one is shouting one and one is uh, shouting zero i don't know but uh, this is the problem why um, the data can't be read correctly because of this funky signals uh, going on okay so um, i just so what i now did i removed all the other eproms from their sockets and now this is what the signal looks like in circuit it looks um, good and uh, the the interesting thing is that the uh, fluke now reads the correct uh, value, data value, at the address. It now says 5e, uh, and before uh, we had um, the FF. So one of the other EPROMs in the circuit actually um, seems to have disturbed um, the reading of this EPROM. Um, I think as a next step we could do actually again a signature test on this EEPROM and now see if we can as a whole read it correctly. Okay, so uh, we stop the loop and we do a ROM test and we go again from 0000, 0, 0, 0 to 07FF and we would like to get our 14DE signature. Oh, and it says OK. Some of the other EPROMs in the circuit actually seem to disturb our first EPROM here. So I guess um, I will try to put in the EPROMs one uh, after another and see uh, when the test starts to fail, maybe. Okay, so next EEPROM is in, test just finished, and it is still okay. Okay, so by adding the ROMs um, step by step, I actually noticed as soon as I'm putting this guy in, uh, the data signals uh, seem to be uh, corrupted. So maybe this guy is talking even, uh, even uh, if he isn't... Uh, being mm -hmm. selected or even if he isn't being asked and uh, so we have to get rid of this guy if he isn't in the circuit then all of those other seven eproms can can actually be still read and return a good signature i already checked all of those so uh, we will replace this guy and uh, just burn a new i a new eprom for him 
as a replacement and then, then see uh, what we get if we have all our uh, ROMs back. Okay, so now uh, that this guy has been replaced, uh, we actually get the correct signature for him. Uh, and also, uh, we still get the uh, correct signature for all the um, other EPROMs. So this is um, like for the first EPROM in the circuit. Um, that is, this one is okay. And uh, the other one, the one that we replaced, I think it was 32D or something. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, that also works. So now uh, all the EPROMs actually uh, check out fine. So uh, this would be the time, I guess, to uh, give the game another go and see what it does. Okay, we can actually start the game uh, using the Fluke. We don't even have to put the uh, microprocessor in. We can just press run UUT, UUT meaning unit under test. And we can let the program run, normally from address zero. Let's take a look. <clears throat> okay. It looks kind of different compared to what we did get at the beginning. It's not really quite what we were expecting to see, really. I don't know, is it doing something here? Interesting. Hmm. looks kind of different in between there's probably still something wrong uh, with the video circuit because you got like two parts of the screen and uh, in those two parts the lines mostly um, seem to, or the columns, uh, seem to contain uh, the um, same item in every line. Hmm. Oh, 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 see this? Insert coin, one player, one coin. Oops, that, that was actually a sign of life for short glimpse we did see the game well interesting maybe the game is actually already running but has some uh, video problems so great success i would say really nice okay so maybe we can try to look at the uh, at the video circuit and uh, see if we can find any problems there, maybe with the um, <clears throat> logic probe and the schematics. Okay, I just noticed something very interesting, which I would like to show you. Um, I was looking at the uh, video circuitry, which is um, over here. Those are four RAM chips and four <coughs> and two EPROMs and another four RAM chips and an another two EPROMs and these all belong to the video uh, output circuit so this is all video memory and uh, the funny thing that I notice is when I'm um, when I'm touching this uh, RAM chip just uh, with my hands then um, well the screen is flickering at the moment nothing much really changes 
but um, if I'm touching the RAM chips in this uh, uh, RAM bank, then I look at the screen what happens. I'm touching them now. It's, I'm letting go again. Oop, and I'm touching them again, letting go, touching them again. So I can actually influence this uh, this scrambling mess uh, going on by touching the uh, RAM chips. But not these uh, RAM chips, only, it only works on this side. And another I see that uh, this uh, phenomenon can be evoked is IC33. If I touch IC33, uh, same thing. I can actually, you know, irritate the screen, so to say. So I guess um, um, that there's a problem with either data lines or address lines on these RAMs or maybe enabled signals um, if you can actually um, just by touching the, the legs of an IC if you can uh, thereby manipulate the end result or the output of the IC then it is very likely that there is a floating signal involved and um, you as a grounded person touching those pins you uh, might be pulling a signal line uh, to low which was floating uh, before and this might actually alter the output of the IC so in a complete working board set you would never expect that touching any IC with your uh, fingers would lead uh, to a graphical uh, 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 to scrambled graphics on the screen. This would be impossible if all pins are actually uh, drawn to a certain potential. So very likely that we have um, lost some lines here and we do have some floating lines here and we can of course look into this uh, with uh, our logic probe. Okay, I actually did find something if I'm probing this signal on the IC this is some this is an irritating it's toggling between floating and high I would say it's not really the light is not really switching between on and off like it would in a, in a regular uh, pulsating signal. I can, for comparison, I can show you this signal on the other RAM bank. So this is the first address pin of the RAM chip, which is pin four. So we look at this on the other RAM bank, which should be okay. And this is how the signal should look like on the logic probe. So light is flashing and it's flashing between the on and off state. But over here we can also look at the other lines. This is line number five. This seems to be floating completely. Okay, line, uh, pin number six, another address line. We are switching again between floating and um, high. So the address lines are out. And which are the address lines? address lines are coming into the RAMs here. They are being distributed to all four RAMs of this bank and they are coming from IC32. Okay, we actually could have expected that because IC32 was also touch sensitive. So this IC has outputs on LEX479 for instance. We can check those. Okay, we have line number four here, and it's also um, a signal which is not correct. It makes sense to actually check that because there could be a, just a connection problem between this IC and the RAM. So uh, um, uh, a PCB trace which has been damaged or anything, no, but the output of the uh, IC is not in order. Let's see uh, what inputs we have. For instance, we have two, three, five, and six are inputs on this IC. 
Okay, so we check no two, three, five, six. Okay, inputs seem to be there. Um, yeah, well, uh, there's also a select pin, so pin one. Pin one is a toggling signal. Okay, so it's intermittently selected. And um, yeah, it's um, it's a multiplexer, by the way. So a chip that uh, switches between those two inputs and puts either this one out here or this one out here. Um, and there's another, there's sort of an enable line, which is permanently pulled low. So it is enabled all the time. So it is either uh, multiplexing this or this uh, input through to this output. Uh, and the selection is done with uh, pin one. So the inputs are there. The selection uh, bit is toggling. The the chip enable is permanently on. So this chip has to be bad. So I think uh, we should unsolder IC32. Look for a replacement and see if we get any improvement with our graphics. On our trusty uh, parts PCB from, from the Phoenix repairs, I actually found a replacement uh, one, uh, LS157 for this um, bad one that we can use. So I will unsolder that and uh, put this uh, in our board. I already did put a socket in. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so I replaced the IC. Um, right here and just uh, fired up the PCB again so let's uh, run uh, the game okay one moment does it actually run oh holy moly Look at this. This is all it was. Okay, so the game was actually completely running. You just couldn't see much of it just because one of the address ICs from uh, of one of the video memory banks was uh, not working. Wow, that is amazing. Great. I don't know actually if the colors are correct, but um, yeah, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the video, I used one of the color prompts from um, from the Phoenix game. So the colors may be off, but um, hey, the game is, is running clearly by now. So let's uh, let's see if it plays and let's check the sound and everything else well, first impression is just great well the game is actually completely running I'm playing it right now even with uh, sound and uh, everything oh. <laughs> just screwed up there okay So it seems to be everything it seems to be working fine actually. Oh. Okay, just great. So I would say uh, uh, this repair is actually finished. Um, I will have to replace uh, the color from, but uh, otherwise this board is uh, working fine. So this is this is very good because now also for the second repair we also have the second board set uh, up here. We have to get some of the uh, missing parts 
and then we can uh, use this board set to make the repair of uh, the other board set much easier because uh, then again if we want to uh, we can fix those boards individually we, we know if we have a working uh, CPU board for the game we can use the other RAM board and see uh, what we get and uh, vice versa with the uh, working logic board so really nice even without a uh, without a good start, I would say, compared to the Phoenix uh, repair, uh, we did quite all right. All it took was the replacement of this EEPROM here, which was mess somehow messing up uh, the complete uh, program, and we replaced this um, I see here, and uh, which was actually the main problem after uh, we got the program running. Um, and uh, we did this just actually on the fly by uh, just uh, fiddling around with the ICs and noticing its influence on the uh, graphics. Uh, very interesting. Didn't I, I didn't really uh, think that this um, repair would end so quickly, but uh, well, I'm happy of course. So uh, this will be it for this video, I guess. And uh, of course, uh, see you uh, back in part four when we're looking into the uh, final PCB combination uh, that is left and uh, again as always uh, if you liked uh, the video um, if you enjoyed the video please um, feel free to subscribe to my channel feel free to watch uh, my other videos and um, also if you have any questions please uh, um, ask, uh, ask me in the comments below I will be happy to answer all your questions so again Thank you very much and until the next video, bye bye.